Uh, I would like to start uh, the section right now. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, Ho Chi Minh City Society of uh, Asthma, Allergy, and Clinical Immunology is organizing a one-week CME class about management of asthma and allergic diseases in children. And uh, today we will have a special lecture with the topic is allergic airway disease in the pandemic from epidemiology to management. And it's a big honor of us to have a special guest on this webinar, Professor Ruby Bawanga. Professor Ruby Bawanga, thank you for joining us today. And uh, first of all, I would like to introduce about our special uh, speaker, Professor Ruby Bawanga has been president of the World Allergy Organization, WOW, uh, from 2012 to 2013. And she is the first Indian and the first woman president of WOW. Currently, she is a president of the Asia Pacific Association of Allergy, Asthma, and Clinical Immunology, or APATI, and council members of Collegium International Allergolicum CIA. She is professor of allergy department of pediatrics at Nippon Medical School in Tokyo, Japan, and the guest professor at Sowa University School of Medicine, Tokyo, Japan, and Kyunghee University uh, uh, School of Medicine in Seoul, Korea and also St. John Medical College, Begaluru, India. Besides her clinical and teaching assessment in allergy, her research has focused on the cellular and molecular mechanisms of allergy, impact of environmental pollutants, and novel therapies for allergy. And she has 500 publications, and she's an editor of several peer-reviewed journals and books, including Allergy Frontier, the Wild White Book uh, on Allergy, Update on Respiratory Disorders, and so please give a big applause to welcome Professor Rui Bawanka. And uh, I also would like to introduce uh, Dr. Dang Thi Kim Huynh. She is a very active member of uh, Ho Chi Minh City Society of Allergy, Asthma, and Clinical Immunology. And actually, we are waiting for Professor Lan. Maybe she has a certain work and she cannot come in time. And uh, she will come later, I think. And uh, so... Um, Professor Ruby, could you please say something, a message or a hello to uh, the member of Portimin uh, uh, City Society, please. Hello, everyone, and um, uh, warm greetings from the Apache to all of you. Uh, as you know, this is a very important uh, uh, week for Apache because we are uh, celebrating the Apache Allergy Week. This is the second time we are celebrating the first one was in 2019 when we did it on air pollution and climate change. We didn't do one last year because of the COVID situation. And this time we are focusing on COVID allergies and vaccines, how to manage allergies and how to manage the pandemic. Uh, I am greatly impressed by the uh, Ho Chi Minh City uh, um, Allergy uh, Society and all of you with your energy and passion. And I've seen uh, Professor uh, Dai, who is so actively involved uh, uh, in Apache, in many initiatives, in our different publications. And I'm looking forward to many more of you actually becoming very active in Apache because this is our region and we have an ownership to this region so let us do, join hands together and do our best to develop the speciality of allergy uh, in our region. So I put a warm welcome uh, and hands open, arms open to all of you. Thank you very much, Professor Ruby. We are so thankful to you about your support and uh, everything you did for Ho Chi Minh City Society of Allergy and Asthma and Clinical Immunology. And uh, today is a very special day and uh, please let me give me some minute to translate uh, your message to the audience. Uh, uh, bà Professor Ruby bà nói rằng là cái, uh, uh, cái bà là chủ tịch của hội Apache và bà rất là vui là hôm nay có mặt ở đây để cùng với mình trao đổi và thực ra là cái uh, cái chương trình Allergy Week á, là của Apache là diễn ra năm 2019 và năm 2020 thì do dịch cho nên là bị delay không có làm năm nay thì làm lại và cái cái chủ đề chính cũng là về cái Covid 19 một cái vấn đề rất là nóng hỏi và bà đó thì uh, đang rất là muốn phát triển cái Apache cùng với lại những cái hội thành viên trong đó cái hội thành viên của Việt Nam của mình cho nên là hôm nay bà bà có một cái bài nói với chúng ta và bà luôn luôn welcome tất cả những cái thành viên của các cái hội thành viên trên thế giới trong đó có Việt Nam của mình Thank you, Professor Ruby. Uh, so I think uh, the screen is yours now, and uh, I think you can start your lecture, special lecture, please. Yeah, I will just start. I'm trying to get the, the slides in. Yeah. 
just a minute, just a minute. Give me two minutes. Uh, okay. So let me go to screen share. Oh, it says host disabled participants screen sharing. Uh, I, know. I, know. Maybe I will fix this. Okay, please wait for a minute. Yeah, no problem, no problem. Okay, I think you are host now, so please try to share the screen again. Okay. Oh, yes. Okay, it's, it's working now. Ah. Uh, Professor Ruby, uh, it's our honor to welcome Professor Lady Duc Lang, Chairwoman of uh, Ho Chi Minh City Society of Allergy and Asthma and Clinical Immunology. Uh, Professor Lang is here with us today. Uh, and uh, Professor Lang, could you please say uh, something to say hello to Professor Ruby? Yeah. Uh, hi, Professor Ruby. Uh, hello. So nice to see you, even if not face to face. Lovely to see you. Yeah, it's a so long time that we can meet each other. Yes, and I hope we can meet face to face soon. Yeah, yeah, I hope so. I have, <laughs> I have received so many email from you, and thanks of uh, Dr. Yu, he is a very active and to make connection between us. Yeah, so thank you so much for sharing up to us all of those things today. Now, thank you so much for organizing this. We are very happy that uh, you organize uh, an event for Apache Allergy Week. This is a great honor that our uh, society in the region is actually actively working closely with Apache. And uh, everything is about that. It's a close collaboration and uh, uh, friendship. So we look forward to more and more uh, collaborations. Okay. Thank, thank you, Professor Lan and Professor Ruby, and we cannot wait more to listen to <laughs> So please start it. Thank you. Okay. okay. So I'm going to talk about uh, the COVID-19, um, and I know it's not a big problem right now in Vietnam um, because you have very successfully controlled it. It is one of the few countries in Asia, Asia Pacific, and in fact, that's what uh, the World Health Organization leadership said. Uh, yesterday that, you know, uh, compared to all the other regions, Asia, some of the Asian countries have so well controlled the disease and Vietnam is very much so hearty congratulations on that. But even having said that, in order to this, uh, you know, to address this because it's a global uh, pandemic and it restricts our movement around the world, it restricts our collaboration, our face-to-face -face meetings, our life in many ways. So I just like to give a little bit overview of COVID-19 also, the way it is in the, um, uh, immunologically and how it's related to allergies and asthma and a little bit about the management in this uh, situation. So as you can see here, and I'm sure you must be knowing these uh, uh, data, we know that SARS uh, was first occurred in uh, 2002, 2003, uh, SARS-CoV-1, uh, then we had the MERS in Middle East, and then now is the SARS-CoV-2. We just want to highlight here is that uh, the uh, key uh, factor here is this lower part, which shows that um, angiotensin 2, ACE2 receptor, is the common receptor for SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2. And if you look at the sequence of events that have happened through the uh, evolution of this disease, it was first reported in December, on 30th of December. Then the virus was isolated 7th of Jan. Then they sequenced uh, the um, virus. The bats were considered as the origin of it. Uh, Wuhan went into lockdown during the Chinese New Year. And then, of course, it became a global health emergency in, on 30th of Jan. 
And by the middle of uh, February, the name, the disease was named COVID-19 and the virus was uh, named SARS-CoV-2. And of course, the ultrastructure or the ACE2 receptor was reported as the receptor. Now, we all know that, it, I mean, asthmatics and um, patients with uh, respiratory allergies are more susceptible to viral infections. And that's why for influenza, we always advise that asthmatics should have their influenza vaccine. So this is very important for us, even in the context, even if uh, we don't have that burden in our country right now, but also to understand it because it's a, it's a pandemic and situations uh, change. And we also travel outside uh, being exposed to this. So we know that the virus has many proteins, but just want to highlight the key important protein here is a spike protein. And that's uh, against which, or that's the target to which uh, the um, different vaccines are being made. Now, what is, as I said earlier, that the virus binds to the ACE2 receptor. This is the ACE2 receptor that is seen on pneumocytes. And once they bind to that on the pneumocytes, as well as on the vascular endothelium, then the virus bound cells migrate to the blood, through the bloodstream to the other organs to cause multi-organ disease. So in a more milder form, it gets contained, but in a more severe form, it will then cause multi-organ disease. As you can see in many countries in Europe, in the United States, it uh, was really, even in children, it showed something like a Kawasaki disease kind of symptoms. Now, basically, as you know, the presentation is fever, cough, fatigue, gastrointestinal symptoms and chest tightness. But what is interesting is the common comorbidities were mainly hypertension and diabetes, but asthma was not really considered as a major comorbidity in this uh, early reports from uh, China of 140 patients which usually asthma sh should be a comorbidity for many of the viral infections. The other important part is that this disease manifests also with systemic uh, manifestations, not just respiratory. And as you can see here, like hemoptysis or acute cardiac injury, uh, hypoxemia, lymphopenia, diarrhea, that is gastrointestinal coagulopathy, skin manifestations, Guillain-Barre and Kawasaki disease. And of course, the CT scan uh, shows the ground glass appearance. When you look at the mechanisms of COVID-19 inflammatory response, as I mentioned earlier, it binds to the pneumocytes, the virus, the ACE2 receptor. And from there, it causes actually a dampening of the interferon gamma response. It actually causes the infiltration of monocytes, macrophages, and uh, neutrophils into the tissue. And of course, then there is a Th1 and Th2, um, uh, sorry, Th1, Th17 is induced and the specific antibodies are produced. Now, if you look at the risk factors of uh, COVID-19, what are the risk factors? If you look, what, to have a poor clinical outcome is when there are more comorbidities like diabetes, hypertension, uh, obesity, and cancer, you're more likely to get more severe uh, disease as compared to those who do not have those comorbidities. Again, the elderly are more prone. Those that have higher CRP, those that have higher interleukin-6, and those that have higher ESR. And then there are three phases. The first phase or the early infection is the viral response. The second phase is a pulmonary response. And the third phase is basically the hyperinflammation response. So in the milder stage, you just get fever and dry cough and diarrhea headache. Basically, there is a lymphopenia and increased D-dimer and LDH. Then in the more second stage, there is breathlessness, shortness of breath, hypoxia, and you can find the abnormal chest findings and low normal procalcitonin. And then in the more hyperinflammatory phase, like a cytokine storm, you can get ARDS, acute respiratory disease, uh, distress syndrome, SIR, shock, cardiac failure, and then a variety of uh, different inflammatory markers are increased like CRP, LDH, 
IL-6, D-dimer, ferritin, troponin, and uh, procalcitin, and so on. And then, as you can see, uh, sorry, not uh, pro BNP and uh, are also elevated. Now, these are the different treatments that have been used, like antiviral or those that are actually uh, immun immunomodulators that you can see here across these uh, stages of disease. Now, when the person gets infected with COVID-19, you can actually get a regulated inflammation that there is a balance between the pro-inflammatory and the anti-inflammatory cytokines. And this results in mild disease to moderate uh, uh, disease. And there is a resolution of the disease because there is viral cre uh, clearance because of efficient interferon gamma production. On the other hand, if that doesn't happen, and there is an impaired interferon gamma production, then the virus persists and there is viral PAMPs and tissue damage uh, damps, and there is this causes an auto amplification loop. And this causes uh, exacerbated inflammation with a large number of cytokines being released and then chemotaxis of the different inflammatory cells, polymorphic nuclear cells, monocytes, and clinically ARDS, multi-organ failure, and death. Now, when we look at this, it also resembles what we call as a classical mass uh, that typically occurs outside of the lungs. But in uh, the case of COVID-19, this classical mass is seen inside of the lung. So you can see high cytokine profile mainly increased interleukin-1 beta, 2, 6, 17, 8, TNF-alpha, and CCL2. And this is studied looking at the case, cases in the ICU, non-ICU cases, and normals. And as you can see here, the plasma levels of interleukin-2, uh, interleukin 7, interleukin-10, GCSF, IP-10, MCP-1, MIP-1-alpha, and TNF-alpha, were all higher in the ICU patients as uh, compared to non-ICU. They're basically more of the pro-inflammatory cytokines. So what are the biomarkers of the cytokine storm or the more severe disease? Well, as you can see, a CRP, D-dimer, LDH, ferritin, uh, procalcitin, and IL-25, uh, interferon gamma, and IL-1 beta. So these are all biomarkers of the cytokine storm. So based on that, again, uh, um, the different therapy, uh, therapeutic modalities are there. Like you can see uh, IL-6 inhibitors, IL-2 inhibitors, or JAK inhibitors, or IL-1 uh, inhibitors. So many of these treatments uh, or, or immunomodulators are actually targeting these different biomarkers of the cytokine storm. Now coming to COVID-19, asthma and allergies. This is very important because this is our speciality. We are treating patients with asthma allergies. At least now uh, in Japan also, we can have face-to-face -face consult with our patients. But when there was a shutdown, of course, we don't have severe lockdown, but uh, state of emergency, many of the patients were reluctant to come to the hospital because they were scared of getting uh, the uh, COVID infection. But in several other countries, they couldn't even go to the doctor. So telemedicine was being practiced. But I understand in Vietnam, you can do face-to-face -face consults, so it is a much easier situation. But what, what is important is to understand the relationship between COVID-19, asthma, and allergies, and what are the specific things we need to take care of in, in, in this situation during the pandemic. Because we are not only talking about the patients who are living in the country, but I'm sure uh, Vietnamese so will be traveling outside. So they need to get guidance from you as what they should take care of when they are traveling also. Now, what, what is interesting here is when you look at the prevalence of asthma in uh, the areas that were severely hit with um, uh, the COVID-19, this is Italy in its first wave, the number of cases of asthma were very few. 
indicating that asthma is not really a comorbidity. And this is also seen in our survey. Uh, uh, Dr. Dai and Professor Lan are also co-authors of this uh, manuscript. And actually, um, uh, this paper we are uh, in the process of uh, review. And here we have shown also in Asia that asthma is not really a comorbidity uh, of uh, COVID-19. So why is this so? What is the reason? Now, there are many publications. There are lots of publications on this. So this is not the only publication. There are many, many. But what is the hypothesis of this? So when you get SARS-CoV-2 infection, what happens is because ACE2 receptor and TMP RSS2 are the mucosal membrane receptors to which the SARS-CoV-2 actually binds, you can see there is, they are upregulated in case of SARS-CoV-2. There is increased IL-6 and TNF-alpha, diminished TN interferon gamma, type 1, type 3, increased inflammatory macrophages, uh, up, up regulation or increased number of CD8 positive cytotoxic T cells. So there is the T lymphocyte exhaustion and lymphocytopenia or a cytokine storm. So just to say again that there is increased ACE2 receptor and TMPRSS2. There's increased inflammatory, pro-inflammatory cytokines, increased CD8 positive cytotoxic cells, a reduced interferon gamma response and lymphocytopenia leading to cytokine storm. So there is an aberrant vi uh, antivirus immunity uh, causing the upregulation of inflammatory type of macrophages or M1 type from the M0 type. What happens in allergy is allergy, there is a reduced expression of ACE2. So now when there is a reduced expression of ACE2, what happens? there are less receptors to which the SARS-CoV-2 can bind. So reduce S2 and reduce TMPR SS2. So the binding of the number of viruses are less. And if the less number of viruses bind, then the less uh, chance of infection uh, in these patients. Again, you can find that there is increased MBL and SPD. These are surfactant proteins. And these surfactant proteins actually compete with ACE2 and TMP RSS2 for viral binding. So if the virus already, if it's already blocked, uh, if, the, if, the, uh, if the MBL surfactant proteins already bind with the ACE2, then the virus cannot bind with the ACE2 receptor. So there is a competition over there. And then there is increased reprogrammed macrophages, increased ILC2s, increase uh, in NK cells, uh, increase CD4 positive T helper cells. And on top of that, we know that patients with uh, allergic diseases and asthma are on I in inhaled corticosteroids and LABA, or they might be taking anti-IgE uh, biologics like that. So these again have an antiviral effect. So in the case of allergic, uh, in the case of asthma, you get a kind of trained immunity and there is a reprogrammed macrophages or the M2 type of macrophages. So these people or asthmatics are less likely to have COVID-19. Now this can be also seen in this figure because you're looking at IL-13 negative and IL-13 positive sample treatment. So this is the expression in the nasal epithelium and this is in the bronchial epithelium. And this you're looking at ACE2 expression. So when you actually expose, expose the nasal epithelium to interleukin-13 and the bronchial epithelium to interleukin-13, you can see there is a down-regulation of the ACE2 receptor, which means a TH2 environment actually will down-regulate the ACE2 receptor. And this is what you see in asthmatics because they're more TH2, there is a down-regulation of the ACE2 receptor. Then again, looking at allergen challenge, what happens if you do a nasal allergen challenge, you do a bronchial allergen challenge. Again, you can see that after the allergen challenge, there is a down-regulation uh, of the ACE2 receptor expression. After bronchial allergen challenge, also there is a down-regulation of the ACE2 receptor, clearly showing that allergen or TH2 type mediated uh, inflammation into leukin 13 down-regulates ACE2 receptor. So this modulation of the ACE2 receptor by type 2 inflammatory responses suggests that 
there we need to evaluate the role, role of type 2 immune regulation in understanding the pathogenesis of COVID-19 and is asthma uh, some way protecting the patients from getting uh, COVID-19. Uh, but having said that, let's also look at uh, the other factors like, for example, self-containment. There is a significant increase in adherence to inhaled therapy uh, in this period. We find that patients are more compliant and more adherent to their inhaled therapies. The intrinsic factor, as I already mentioned, reduction in the ACE2 and TMP RSS2 receptor. And finally, that many of these patients on inhaled corticosteroids, the inhaled corticosteroids itself might prevent or mitigate the development of uh, COVID infections. Now coming to allergic rhinitis, what is the current knowledge that we have? Well, we uh, advise antihistamines or intranasal uh, steroid sprays for patients with allergic rhinitis. And very often inhaled cortico in intranasal corticosteroids are used in patients uh, with um, uh, allergic rhinitis, especially with uh, uh, nasal obstruction uh, and not really well controlled with uh, uh, just antihistamines. So what is the recommendation here? The recommendation here is not, of course, based on some real uh, uh, evidence-based uh, study looking at some randomized placebo-controlled double-blind study, but the advice by the Arya Yaki guidelines uh, says very clearly that do not stop the local intranasal corticosteroid. It's not going to to have a negative effect on the other way, on the other hand, it actually protects uh, you. So suppression of the immune system has not been proven. And so it's better to use the intranasal steroids. So you prevent, uh, also protect the people around you by reduced sneezing and st stopping the spread because there are also asymptomatic uh, people who may spread the virus. What about for asthma? As I said, please advise the patients with asthma to continue their prescribed asthma medications, whether it is like a Montelukast or your anti-leukotrines, if it's very mild, or inhaled corticosteroids, or inhaled corticosteroids plus LABA. Whatever they are taking, please ask them to continue taking their prescribed asthma medications. This is very important. And all of them should have a good asthma action plan, and also they should have, of course, they have uh, uh, acute exacerbation. They may be on oral corticosteroids, but that is fine, but that's not uh, for regular. It's only for a short course for acute exacerbation. But uh, uh, constantly monitor the, your symptoms and also uh, continue the treatment. One key important point is avoid nebulizers where possible. This the reason is because the nebulizers may induce risk of disseminating the virus to other patients and to healthcare professionals. So therefore we advise pressurized MDIs via a large spacer uh, as compared to um, uh, using a nebulizer in treating patients with acute exacerbations uh, or with a, a mouthpiece that is tightly fitting uh, face mask if required. Also, we uh, say to avoid spirometry in patients with confirmed or suspected COVID-19 and also uh, follow strict infection control procedures uh, for aerosol generating procedures are needed. Like, as I said, if nebulizer is needed, please uh, try to use uh, uh, pressurized MDIs or uh, otherwise uh, use uh, with a large spacer or a mouthpiece that is tightly fitting ma face mask if required. I know you do not have immunotherapy in uh, Vietnam, but in general, just to uh, mention that also immunotherapy, you're allowed to continue, but of course, injectable immunotherapy it depends. If you cannot visit the hospital, the recommendation uh, could you have to check with your physician whether you can switch to sublingual for some time or not. But this is again not a problem that you are facing in uh, Vietnam because you do not have immunotherapy there. 
This is just the rollout of the vaccines in the different Asian Pacific countries. I see Vietnam not here. And again, it's probably because you are already uh, do not have infections uh, uh, in Vietnam. But in general, uh, uh, you know, it is important uh, to uh, try to get vaccinated in order to uh, protect yourself because, you know, as we travel and as we move around, we are exposed to many different uh, circumstances and people. And finally, I'd like to just show um, uh, our board. This is our board members. This is our event in China when we had the 2019 first international conference. Uh, 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 this is the first time we had like a Apache International Conference. We only had a Congress before that. Apache is now very active. We have 22 committees. So if you are interested, please feel free to volunteer to any of these committees. These are mentioned on the website and please volunteer. We will be more than happy to involve you because we are uh, doing surveys, position papers, consensus documents. Uh, and a lot of educational initiatives. We have a regular news and notes that highlights our member societies, also highlights the most important activities and the publications, literature highlights, and also uh, the COVID-19 uh, resource center and uh, guidance on the um, management of uh, adverse effects, basically safe implementation of vaccines and so on. And finally, I'd like to invite you to join us at the Apache International Conference in Kaohsiung in Taiwan. We hope that it will be an in-person meeting in October if things uh, get better and people are vaccinated and people can start moving. If not, it will be a hybrid meeting, uh, but please participate, please register for it. And of course, then this, we are pretty hopeful that in Manila, we would definitely be able to meet face to face because this is October 2022. So in conclusion, I would like to say that uh, we also look forward to having uh, at least an international conference uh, for a start in Vietnam. We'd be very happy uh, to join you all for it. So uh, we can continue to do uh, CME activities. Recently, we had a nice lecture by Dr. Dai. Uh, along with two other uh, experts on uh, atopic dermatitis. And we are continuing to do those kind of educational uh, web lectures. So please uh, let me know, uh, let the secretariat also know your area of interest and expertise, and we would uh, work together with you. And I've known Professor Lan also for many, many years. And so uh, there are many uh, um, platforms we have collaborated together, including God. And uh, so uh, I look forward to many, many initiatives with Vietnam. And even if you have in, uh, certain projects that you think are important for Vietnam that we have not addressed, maybe for example, um, allergy to TB drugs or you know whatever is important within your uh, area, I'm not very uh, familiar on that. Uh, if, you, if you need a training school for the young people, if you need uh, some kind of web uh, initiatives, online modules, please uh, reach out to me and we will be more than happy to work together with you and with our international advisors also that work together with us to bring the best uh, to uh, Vietnam and also as a collaboration between the two organizations. So with this, I'd like to end my talk and I'm happy to take questions. Uh, I know I have not given a very detailed uh, uh, presentation on allergic rhinitis and asthma, but uh, I'm happy to take the questions uh, from all of you. Thank you so much, Professor Roby. You have given us so many interest information and you have seen that we have so many doctors attending today. And... Uh, we will have uh, some questions for you from our doctors and from our expert here. So. Um, before uh, the doctor will ask some questions, I have a very short report about the COVID-19 situation in Vietnam to say to you that the numbers of infected cases is 2,600 
uh, 96 cases of infected people and number of treated cases, 2,429 cases oh. and the number of death cases, only 35 people. And a uh, very good number is a number of vaccinated people now is 58,000. 248 oh. people vaccinated already with the vaccine from AstraZeneca. Oh, I don't know. I, I, I don't know why uh, it was not on. Our, please send me those details. We will put that on the table. Yeah. Yes, yes. Because our table includes the vaccines from all the countries. And uh, we will put that, you know, let us know when it was started. And uh, that will be really great. Yes, I will send you the information later. Yes, yes. And actually, um, in relation to what you said, yesterday in our live webinar uh, with the World Health Organization, uh, Dr. Maria, who's the lead of uh, COVID-19 uh, team of, in WHO, uh, I mean, you will be seeing her all the time on CNN and all the, she's always doing press conferences. So she actually mentioned that Asia has done very well and she mentioned some countries, especially in Asia, like Vietnam or Taiwan, have really done a great job in controlling the disease because they have learned from the SARS-CoV-1 uh, uh, you know, experience how to uh, manage and control. And she was really congratulating. Um, uh, so I congratulations from my side also to, to you for, I mean, this is uh, unbelievable because in, in November, we had just in Tokyo, just in Tokyo, we had 2,500 cases. And this is despite the fact that in, in Japan, we are very compliant of wearing face masks and, and uh, you know, washing hand hygiene, respiratory hygiene. Even then we had that. So it's uh, really commendable how Vietnam managed it. Yes, we have yes. to learn from you. Yes, I think so. Uh, we did a good thing and you can see that now we can gather together in the room and have a meeting together like this. So um, please let, uh, give me some minutes to summarize your talk in Vietnamese so that the doctor can get sure. the idea. Sure, sure. Uh, bà Ruby, bà có trình bày với, với mình chắc là quý vị cũng nghe được sơ sơ đúng không ạ? Uh, có một số người chắc nghe được trăm phần trăm. Dạ, dạ. Dạ, thì... Uh, uh, Cái nội dung của bà nói ngày hôm nay đó là về cái vấn đề về cái cơ chế sinh bệnh học của cái COVID-19 của cái SARS-CoV-2 và cái mối liên hệ của nó với những cái bệnh dị ứng. Thì một số cái ý chính thì bác sĩ Duy xin tấm tắt cái thứ nhất là bà đầu tiên bà nói về cái 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 cơ chế mà cái virus nó xâm nhập vô cơ thể của mình nó là phải qua một số cái cụ thể trên bề mặt cái tế bào bị mô đường hô hấp. Ví dụ đặc biệt cái đó là cái ACE2 là cái thuộc angiotensinogen 2 đó. À, cái thứ hai là bà có nói về cái cytokine storm thì là là cái cơn bão cytokine mà mình đã từng nghe nói tới trong những cái trường hợp mà nhiễm uh, virus nặng đó nó sẽ gây ra những cái cơn bão cytokine và những cái cơn bão đó mới là cái nguyên nhân chính gây cái tổn thương cái mô của mình khi mà cái cơ thể mình có hệ miễn dịch đáp ứng với lại những cái tác nhân gây bệnh bên ngoài thì trong cái cơn bão cytokine đó có nhiều cái cytokine khác nhau lắm trong đó có một số cái cytokine là mạc cơ À, mà, mà, mà bác sĩ duy thấy thì họ liệt kê quá nhiều đi cái cytokine nào cũng ngoài cơ hết cho nên cũng không biết cái nào là, là specific cho cái đó thì tiếng nữa chắc cũng xin hỏi thêm bà ruby à, cái thứ hai nữa là bà có nhắc về cái cơ chế bệnh nhân hen suyễn thì ít mắc cái covid hơn á là có nhiều nguyên nhân lắm trong đó cái thứ nhất là do cái giảm cái biểu hiện cái thụ thể aace 2 tại cái thụ thể đó là cái nơi mà virus nó bám vô xong nó nó chui vô tế bào của mình mà trên bệnh nhân hen thì cái thụ thể đó trên cái bề mặt của tế bào môn nó bị giảm đi trên cái virus nó khó nó nó, nó tấn công Cái thứ hai nữa là do một số cái tế bào miễn dịch bẩm sinh trong đó có tế bào giết tự nhiên NK đó. Đó là được kích hoạt lên mà NK là một trong những cái cơ chế mà chống lại cái virus rất hiệu quả của cơ thể của mình. Cái thứ hai nữa là trên bệnh nhân hen nó có cái sự hoạt hóa của cái hệ miễn dịch theo con đường TH2. Quý vị biết mình có TH1, là TH2, là TH17 và nó có một cái tình trạng cân bằng. Tức là khi cái TH2 mà tăng thì TH1 nó lại giảm đi. Cho nên là mà cái TH1 liên quan tới virus, nó liên quan tới interferon, nó liên quan tới những cái cơn bão cytokine. Cho nên trên bệnh nhân hen khi mà cái TH2 nó được hoạt hóa thì cái TH1 nó giảm xuống. Và khi TH1 giảm xuống thì tình trạng viêm do những cái cytokine đó nó lại giảm xuống theo. Cho nên đó là một trong những lý do bệnh nhân hen đó, nó có thể là ít mắc hơn hoặc có thể là mắc thì nó lại nhẹ hơn là những cái bệnh nhân không có bị hen. Và cũng nhờ cái cái TH2 đó mà cái TH2 nó chuyển cái con macrophage đại thực bào đó. À, khi mà nó do TH1 thì ông đại thực bào nó rất là điên cuồng nó, nó nó tàn sát nó tấn công tế bào bị nhiễm và nó gây ra tình trạng viêm rất nặng nhưng khi có TH2 thì con đại thực bào nó lại trở nên hiền dịu hơn nó không có gây viêm nhiều mà nó lại đi sửa chữa những cái mô đã bị viêm nó có hai cái cái cái, cái hướng phát triển của con đại thực bào như vậy tiếp đến đó là có một số cái recommendation từ những cái guideline ví dụ như hen hay viêm mũi dị ứng đó, thì bệnh nhân vẫn phải tiếp tục duy trì những cái thuốc đang điều trị ví dụ như cọc tiêu quýt xịt họng hay là cọc tiêu quýt xịt mũi tùy theo tình trạng bệnh 
và có một điều đặc biệt là cần tránh sử dụng cái nebulizer tức là cái phun khí dung tại vì bà nói là do cái phun khí dung có thể làm lây bệnh từ người này sang người khác thậm chí là lây cho nhân viên y tế tiếp nữa đó là cái bà cũng nghe nói là tránh hô hấp ký cho bệnh nhân nghi ngờ hoặc đã xác định nhiễm covid thì mình nên tránh sử dụng cái hô hấp ký à, còn ngoài ra thì về cái recommendation cho điều trị thì phải sử dụng tiếp tục những cái thuốc đó dạ em tốn chắc gì không biết cô lan có bổ sung hay chị huyên có bổ sung thêm cái ý gì thêm nữa không NK và bác sĩ Duy nói là natural killer là một cái con tế bào mà nó có sẽ tiêu diệt hết tất cả những cái dạng khác. Và trong hãy có nói là nếu mà bệnh nhân của các bạn mà dùng corticoid đừng uống đó, thì cũng vẫn phải tiếp tục sử dụng. Thì các bạn nhớ rồi ha, rất là nặng và mình rất là ít sử dụng tới corticoid đừng uống. Nói chung là vẫn phải tiếp tục sử dụng cái thuốc hen hoặc là viêm mũi dị ứng. phát cho mình cái cơ chế thật sự ra bà không nói mà 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 dễ hiểu đến như vậy nhưng mà nhờ bác sĩ ghi là dân miễn dịch cho nên đã dịch cho chúng mình là cái T1, T2 với lại T17 thì rõ ràng trước đây mình quan niệm rất là không đúng tức là mình nói những người nào bị hen mà nhiễm thêm cúm là nó đã mệt mỏi hơn rồi sợ lắm bây giờ nhiễm thêm covid là còn căng thẳng hơn nhưng mà rõ ràng là nhờ cái cơ chế giống trước đây mình đã được học rồi tức là cơ thể mình được học rồi bây giờ mình vô bằng cái con virus vô hình chung nó lại hủy hoại con virus nó làm mọi chuyện trở nên êm dịu hơn cho nên mọi người sẽ yên tâm sử dụng điều trị cho bệnh nhân như thông thường và không được bỏ thì rõ ràng hồi nãy bà có nói qua bệnh mũi và hen cho mình luôn thì nếu các bạn đang xài cầu tiêu ít như thế nào cho bệnh nhân thì cũng như bạn thôi còn cái chuyện mà hồi nãy bác sĩ duy nhắc về cái mũi laser là khí dung là người ta sợ mình bung cái con virus ra rất nhiều thì gây tai hại cho những người đang khỏe mạnh hoặc kể cả chúng ta đứng đó. đó cho nên thì như vậy thì cái bài của bà là cho mình tin tưởng vô là cái cách điều trị của mình hơn là mình dám điều trị. Yes. Cũng có nói là thay vì dùng nebulizer thì mình sẽ dùng MTI cộng với một cái buồng đệm lớn thì là nó cũng hiệu quả thì nào giờ mình vẫn chứng minh như vậy các bạn ha MTI cộng với buồng đệm thì tương đương với nebulizer. Uh, thank you, Professor Lan, Dr. Huyen, and uh, I got some questions uh, for you, and hope that you can spend some time on answering it. Uh, first, the question is that, um, as you said that the biomarker about the cytokine for uh, COVID-19 is a lot. I, I can see here uh, on the, your table, there are lots of cytokines, and every cytokine is a biomarker. But is there any specific biomarker for COVID-19? Because I think that Uh, the biomarker is not specific for any virus, so it has any specific biomarker for, uh, for SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and the second question is that uh, the people in Vietnam now are very wondering about the side effect of vaccine, uh, COVID-19 vaccine. So could you please um, say a little bit about the side effect of COVID-19 vaccine and what, what side effect that the people who get vaccination should be aware of? Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Both are very, very important questions. Yes, you're absolutely right. Right now, we are like swimming in a sea because uh, COVID-19 is still evolving. If you look at how it was uh, in the beginning, I'm, going, I'm speaking slowly. So uh, if you look at how it was in the beginning and how it has evolved, like in the beginning in many Asian countries, we never found ARDS or cytokine storm. But then as the disease progressed, more severe infections started occurring. And so uh, the disease is evolving. Again, if you look at countries like United States, they have in children Kawasaki disease kind of syndrome. So depending on the type of manifestation, the disease pattern may change. Yes, there are many pro-inflammatory cytokines that are upregulated. But key cytokine that is targeted with treatment are like interleukin-1, anakinra, or tocilizumab is being used again for like anti-IL-6. So these are some of the uh, biologics being used uh, for COVID-19. So again, uh, these are only for like severe disease or different stages. And then you have antivirals like remdesivir and so on. So uh, it's, it's not necessarily specific only to COVID-19. It may be also useful for other 
uh, diseases. But having said that, the way out of this pandemic is vaccination. And that you have very nicely done in Vietnam when you're letting me know how many people got vaccinated because vaccination is the only way out to protect yourself and also to protect the community. Because the more the people get vaccinated, the more likely we can achieve herd immunity. The important part that we should realize, especially when we are talking to the public, because there is so much of vaccine hesitancy. And the reason is because unlike for measles or polio, all these vaccines were developed over so many years and not in real time. So by the time they came out, they showed the efficacy, there were side effects, all vaccines have side effects. You know, for example, many years back, influenza vaccine was not being used in MM, uh, or MMR was not being used in children with egg allergy. Influenza vaccine, even today, many uh, private clinicians don't want to use in children, though it is not prohibited. So there are side effects for uh, all vaccines. It depends on risk versus uh, safety, which is risk versus efficacy, you know, risk versus protection. That balance is very important. None of these were our diseases like, um, uh, like COVID-19. COVID-19 is a pandemic. So you cannot get out. You have limitation to get out of your country. You have limitation to come back. You're limited to get out of your home. So the only way out is vaccination. Now, there are many vaccines. Almost 200 vaccines are being developed. But about 24 are in different stages of clinical trial. And we have six now in the market. One is Sinovac. Then you have the Sputnik. Then you have AstraZeneca. You have uh, um, uh, Moderna, Pfizer, and more recently, uh, J&J. And I believe you have AstraZeneca in Vietnam, right? Yeah. So now for Moderna and Pfizer, the main uh, side effect or uh, adverse reaction they reported was anaphylaxis. But the percentage of that is very, very low. It's like 1.1 in a million doses. And that too, there is, that's why we need to do risk stratification. So the CDC, FDA, uh, the EMA, and now uh, Apache has also created those kind of um, guidance saying which patients, in which patients we should not give it, in which patients we need to assess further. So for example, if the patient has uh, uh, severe uh, anaphylaxis to other vaccines or a severe anaphylaxis to the first dose of the vaccine, then you would not give it. Secondly, if the a patient, a person has uh, anaphylaxis to PEG, polyethyl glycol or polysorbate, which is an excipient in uh, the Moderna vaccine and in the Pfizer vaccine, but is also present in other drugs and in other cosmetics, then in that case, if you have the facility for doing skin testing, like they do a lot in US, you do the skin testing and you make a decision. If you do not, then you would prevent, you would pre not uh, go ahead with the vaccine in these cases. But for people who have food allergies or skin allergies or mild asthma, not severe asthma, but mild asthma, not controlled, uh, con well, uh, reasonably controlled asthma, it's not a contraindication. You can have the vaccine. So that's, uh, these are the criteria. And we have this on our website. You can access it on the website. We have put clear guide, guidelines on that. But for AstraZeneca, now the recent thing that has come out, AstraZeneca, um, recent thing that's come out is about uh, blood clots. And again, this is seen more in younger females and there's, there's cause concern. So some countries have moved their recommendations to not use it in uh, females under 50. So there is been a, but even that, there are like four cases in a million cases. So what is happening is now we have the pandemic and we have the vaccines. So they are both being developed in real time. And if you have the side effect, you have to report it. And so it's causing much more fear 
uh, as compared to the actual reality. So the percentage is like 0.006%. It's so low that the incidence of it. So I think you need to actually evaluate people. Are, do they have very severe comorbidities? What is their condition? Are, do they have a risk uh, in getting it? So if that is not there, these vaccines are safe. And even having said that AstraZeneca and the regulatory bodies and uh, the uh, scientists are looking at this particular side effect and seeing how to address it. They're trying to find out the mechanism. Why is it happening? And they maybe in months to come, we will also have a solution to that. So uh, the key message I'd like to say is whatever vaccine you have in your country, of course, safe implementation is important. So uh, understanding the background of the patient, person, uh, whether the person is high risk or not, that is important. But vaccination is important because that is the only thing that will give us protection and that is the only way out of this pandemic. Okay, uh, thank you very much for your answer. And uh, you know that we already translated the guideline of Apache and posted in the website of, of Ho Chi Minh City Society. And um, as you said that uh, one of the uh, side effects is the blood clot and, uh, and they recommend not use the vaccine for female under 15 years old, is it right? Under 50, five zero. Okay. Some countries say under 30. It's I, okay. Uh, yes. Uh, we give us some minutes, and I can translate uh, your answer to the audience. Yeah. Uh, bà 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 Manca bà nói rằng bây giờ hiện giờ cái vaccine á là cái vaccine nào cũng có nguy cơ hết. Uh, nhưng mà cái vaccine của COVID-19 là tại vì người ta quan tâm rất nhiều và nó mới vừa thành lập gần đây. Nhưng mà cái tỷ lệ mà 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 gì mà gọi là phản ứng phụ là 0.006% là cực kỳ thấp luôn. Uh, nhưng mà mình phải cân bằng giữa cái chuyện lợi ích và nguy cơ trong cái thời buổi này thì nếu mà mình không được chích vaccine thì mình không thể đi đâu được hết trơn. Và cái cái nguy cơ nó sẽ nhiều hơn là cái lợi ích. Uh, cái tiếp theo nữa là uh, bà có nói một số cái là chống chỉ định cho cái vaccine á thì uh, chống chỉ định nó sẽ có là ví dụ như thứ nhất đó là những người mà có tiêm mũi đầu tiên mà có cái triệu chứng dị ứng xảy ra hoặc là những cái người có dị ứng với một số cái chất ví dụ như polysorbate nó, nó nằm ở trong một số cái loại hóa chất mỹ phẩm á thì quý vị có thể lên trang web của hội hen chị Nguyễn Lâm Sàng Hồ Chí Minh á chúng tôi đã dịch rồi cái dịch Professor Ruby, can you can you hear us clearly? No, no. Actually, the screen went off. Ah, okay, okay. Now, now, yeah, now I can hear. Okay. Uh, there are two more questions. The first question is that: Do you think of cases with repositivity to viral RNA? Are they truly reinfected, or just due to the residues of viral RNA? And the second question is: Shall we recommend COVID nineteen vaccination to patients with chronic severe allergic diseases? Please. 
Okay, the first one, I'd like to say it depends on when you are testing. Somebody is infected, you do a RT-PCR to check. Uh, it is true that uh, for some days after, uh, the viral fragments can remain and give you a positive RT-PCR, even though the infection uh, is, you know, uh, even the patient is symptom-free and fine. So very often when the peak, when the first peak was happening, many uh, hospitals were not letting their patients go home till the RT-PCR was negative uh, um, a couple of times. And that was one of the recommendations by the ministries. So, and often it was shown that it was because of the residual. But this residual viral RNA doesn't stay for that long um, uh, over time. So, uh, uh, but what what was the question that if um, the, re is it that they? The reinfection. So, yeah, they, I mean, reinfection of course can occur. And we know that even those who are vaccinated can be, infected. It's the same for influenza vaccine. You take influenza vaccine, you can still be infected, but you will have less severe disease and less likely to die because of the disease. So this is a key factor. The other point about severe chronic allergic disease depends on what. If you have very uh, severe anaphylaxis, I think especially to drugs or vaccines, it would be a contraindication. But if you have like anaphylaxis to foods, I think uh, uh, evaluation by the allergist is important to decide whether the patient should uh, take the vaccine. For example, I, I am severely anaphylactic to crustaceans, to shrimps, lobsters, or even if I touch it, my hands become red. If I eat it, I have, I have, I have stage three anaphylaxis, but I've already had both my shots of Pfizer with no problem. Uh, some countries do not uh, recommend any pre-medication, but I pre-medicated myself uh, with uh, H1 antihistamine, H2 antihistamine, and Montelukast 30 minutes before the vaccine. So this is also one of the ways to try to prevent uh, in a potential case of uh, anaphylaxis, but I don't have uh, anaphylaxis to drugs or other vaccines. So that is the thing. The other thing is whether they have any reaction to any of the recipients. Like if they have taken a vaccine or a drug that has PEG or has polysorbate and they have had a reaction, then it is a contraindication. Yes. Do you think we should do skin tests for the patient who have a high risk of allergic reaction before vaccination? Uh, if they have a potent, if, there, if there's a possibility that they might have a reaction to PEG, if there is some possibility, if like, for example, they have reacted to some cosmetic or some other vaccine that contains PEG or maybe one of the drugs that contain uh, PEG, like Miralax or something. So if they have that kind of history, yes, it, uh, uh, skin testing would be advisable at that stage. So when we do skin testing, we should use the vaccine that we we intend no, to we, or the, the well, well, in US, uh, some people do that, but more importantly, they use Miralax or uh, Miralax or uh, methylprednisolone. They use that for for uh, testing. Yes, thank you, and. Um, Uh, uh, let me in, uh, translate your answer to the audience. Uh, bà Ruby bà trả lời rằng đó là uh, cái vaccine, uh, cái, cái câu hỏi của cái cái câu số 2 là mình có cần phải chích cho những cái người bị dị ứng nặng và bị phản ứng hay không thì bà nói là tùy theo từng người. Nếu mà trước điều đó có cái phản ứng mà anaphylaxis là phản trở nặng với lại phản là cái một số cái chất mà có trong cái vaccine đó, trên cái bài này có trên trên cái trang xã hội có thì mình phải đóng tiền còn nếu mà một cái người mà bị dị ứng với lại cho dù là thức ăn đi chăng nữa dù bà bà cũng giữ một loại thức ăn gì đó nãy mình nghe không có kịp cái chỗ đó bà có giữ một loại thức ăn anaphylaxis luôn là phản vệ luôn nhưng mà chích vaccine vẫn bình thường nhưng mà trong trường hợp của bà thì bác sĩ không có yêu cầu phải dùng cái thuốc trước khi cái dùng remedication là cái thuốc phòng ngừa đó bác sĩ không yêu cầu nhưng mà bà tự bà cho luôn là bà cho cái cái vitamin H một cái vitamin H hai mang trên luôn 30 phút trước khi chích vaccine thì bà hoàn toàn bình thường không có chịu chứng dị ứng gì xảy ra hết hồi nãy thì bác sĩ có hỏi thêm đó là mình có cần làm cái test da cho cái người có nguy cơ chuyển hay không thì bà nói rằng đó là nếu mà cái người đó có nguy cơ diễn một số thành phần trong cái vaccine đó thì mình sẽ làm test da 
nhưng mà không phải dùng cái vaccine mà dùng cái cái chất mà có chứa cái hóa chất đó để test tại vì trong cái đó có nhiều thứ lắm cái này cái này cũng cảm luôn <cười> Bị trẻ em dưới 18 tuổi Sorry, I'm trying to translate another question <cười> Cái này của ai? Có thể đọc cái tiếng Việt được không? Cái này Đó là cái đó là cái chuyện là cái cái khuyến cáo cho tất cả các loại vaccine luôn hay là vaccine covid này? à à à à là tại sao lại tiêm trên những người già lớn tuổi? À người lớn tuổi thì không được chích. À người lớn tuổi là không chích, phụ nữ có thai là không chích. Tại sao như vậy? Có bệnh gì? À tại sao lại? Không có nghe được, không có nghe rõ. từ thứ nhất là từ 18 tuổi trở lên mới được chích, thứ 18 tuổi là không chích rồi. À, từ 18 đến 65 thôi, ngoài cái tuổi đó là không chích. Rồi. Rồi. À, tại sao lại như vậy? Thấy có bộ y tế mình. Nếu có thai là không chích. Ý, ý mình hỏi ý mình hỏi nước ngoài như thế nào Okay. Yeah, cảm ơn anh uh, thật sự ra khi mà vừa có vaccine đó. Hello. Hello. Thì những cái đối tượng đó thì lại cho rằng là không có nguy cơ cao cho bằng những cái người mà như như tụi mình ở đây là nhân viên y tế trước với cái số lượng vaccine hiện giờ đang còn rất là giới hạn rất là ít thì có lẽ là mình sẽ đi theo từng bước và đồng thời là mình cũng chưa biết rõ được các yếu tố nguy cơ cho nên những cái nhân vật nào mà có yếu tố nguy cơ nhiều thì mình sẽ để qua một bên như người lớn hơn 65 tuổi người có bệnh nền 
À, còn cái việc mà giảm tiểu cầu thì cái chuyện này là mới đây thôi thì để sẽ hỏi vào Ruby. Tôi cũng không có nghĩ là người ta đã đưa ra một cái mức tiểu cầu bao nhiêu thì sẽ không không chích được. Còn với phụ nữ có thai thì các bạn sẽ thấy là hầu như là khi đã có thai rồi thì không chích gì hết trơn. Tất cả những cái gì là chuẩn bị trước khi có thai, tất cả các thuốc chích uh, polio, chích uh, tetanus hoặc là chích rubella là đều trước thời kỳ có thai. Uh, Professor Ruby, uh, we we were discussing about the indication for vaccination in some uh, special individual, for example, the pregnant woman or the elderly or children. Uh, and the second thing is about the platelet number, the number of platelet, because um, there is a, a intra a contra indication for the people who have the low level of platelet number. So, um, uh, do you have any any information about? Uh, what number of platelet that we can give the vaccination? For example, under 1,100, 1, under 150,000, uh, 150, for example. Well, um, it's that's a little bit difficult question to, uh, to answer because I don't know if there's any recommendation even by CDC clearly saying uh, that. But if, if the number is uh, low, um, it could be a contraindication. That is uh, one. Regarding pregnant women, I mean, generally, I mean, you know, all clinical trials we never do uh, in pregnant women. But the general statement is that we would avoid the first trimester. Uh, if we avoid the first trimester later on, uh, they can get the vaccine. And uh, that would actually protect them uh, from uh, infection. So that is the general uh, guidance. I also saw a question in the chat box that I found interesting. Yes, yes. Uh, from Tu Trin. Yeah. Yeah. About delayed reactions. Yeah. Yes, so, reaction. Yeah, so I, I will address that also. I mean, we don't uh, uh, recommend any regular patch testing to identify if somebody has a delayed re reaction or not. But delayed reactions are not so common. It's not really common. But occasionally you can have a delayed reaction to a vaccine. And that is generally either T-cell mediated or complement mediated. So what one would have to do is depending on the symptom, if it's like a um uh, you know just a rash or something you probably would give an antihistamine or something but uh in general uh one would investigate if it is complemented media would probably look at the levels of complement and try to understand uh, that um whether or not to give a second dose uh, of the vaccine in that case would be a decision the the treating uh, specialist has to make depending on the severity of the Uh, the reaction, the delayed reaction. Yes, thank you. Um, bà giáo sư nãy có trả lời cái câu hỏi của anh đó về cái uh, cái uh, cái số tiểu cầu thì hiện giờ CDC cũng không có đưa ra con số nào cụ thể hết. Chỉ nói là, là tiểu cầu thấp thì mình sẽ là chống chỉ định thôi. Cái nữa là về phụ nữ có thai thì chống chỉ định trong tam cá nguyệt thứ nhất thì uh, không có chích, uh, không có được chích vaccine. Còn mấy khúc sau thì không biết có chỉ định hay không thì bà cũng không có nói rõ cái chuyện đó. Uh, rồi bác sĩ Tú có hỏi về cái uh, phản ứng. Uh, phản ứng muộn về dị ứng cái vaccine đó thì như thế nào thì bà nói là cái cái hiện tượng phản ứng muộn rất là thấp rất xảy ra lắm và sẽ dựa vào một số cái nguy cơ hay là cái test hay là một số cái xét nghiệm để mà quyết định là cái chuyện có chích tiếp theo hay không dạ xin trả lời với anh như vậy à, có có vị vị nào có câu hỏi nữa không ạ dạ dạ Uh, dear ma'am, I, I uh, one uh, uh, question for you. Um, why does COVID-19 disease rarely in children 
uh, would you like explain uh, this? Uh, well, um, nobody knows why it's so rare in children. And also that again varies from countries to country. Like if you look at United States, there is much more uh, prevalence of COVID-19 in children uh, uh, than you will see in Asia. So it is there, it is not, uh, not there. The other thing is many children, uh, I won't say many, but I, in children it is known that you find asymptomatic um, uh, COVID-19 in these in children. So they might be having the infection, but they are uh, asymptomatic. So that is another thing. So either they are asymptomatic or the other reason is uh, depending on uh, where you are, uh, the children might be uh, affected. Uh, as compared to Asia, it's more common in UK and in US, and especially with this new variant. And uh, also the younger population is getting more affected in, in, in this uh, current wave. Um, but precisely why very young children, like if you're talking about five to six year olds, it's very difficult to know why exactly they are not. Uh, whether it's something to do with their immune development um, or, or not, this is something that is uh, not clearly known. But again, I would say that children are differentially affected depending on where you're coming from. Yeah. Bà Hoa Văn Ca bà nói rằng đó là cái lý do tại sao trẻ em mà bị cái 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 ít cái bệnh đó thì người ta không có biết luôn nhưng mà ở trẻ em có một cái là bà nói là có cái tình trạng bị nhiễm mà không có triệu chứng cho nên nhiều khi bị nhiễm mà không phát hiện ra. À, chứ không phải là cái hôi nhiễm gì giờ ta đang nghiên cứu thêm chứ cũng chưa có rõ ràng về cái cơ chế đó chắc là cũng trễ rồi tại bà mới có một cái đích trước đó rồi sau này ta lại có thêm một cái thuốc tiên nữa chắc là chúng ta nếu có hỏi gì có về sẽ hiểu về cái gì và chia sẻ để gửi cho bà sau để bà sẽ trả lời sau cho chúng ta nha uh, Professor Ruby I think uh, it's too late for you now and uh, I, I think I think uh, people are uh, so interesting about uh, in in your lecture and I think it's outstanding lecture and very informative, very helpful to the doctors in Vietnam. And thank you very much for, for spending a lot of time on, on us on this uh, webinar. So, so amazing. Uh, Professor Lan, do you have some word to say? Uh, on behalf of our attendees, we would like to express our deep gratitude to, for you for such a beautiful presentation and also very thoughtfully answers to our questions. I think that we have a, still have many questions and Dr. Yui will send to you those questions. I hope that <laughs> we'll see you in Kyoto, in Manila and in Taiwan. So hope okay. to see you. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, thank you. So looking forward to seeing all of you. Thank you very much for organizing this beautiful and I'm so happy to see so many people. It's, it's such a pleasure to see. I congratulate you for organizing this so well in such a short time and also for all the efforts in coming together and also for containing the COVID-19 in, uh, in Vietnam. So let us continue to work together and together we will make allergy in Asia very strong. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay. Bye. Uh, I was just going to say something. I just forgot. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, uh, come on back. Come on back. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Your pronunciation is very good. <laughs> thank you for that. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. Thank you.